A man by the name of Robert discovered a secret in the woods that left him incredibly shaken and disturbed. It was sometime in October of 96 when a city resident in his 40s first heard the voices. Now, you might say, well, he was schizophrenic, but hold on here. He had traveled to the countryside to visit his mother and extended family. They then went out to dinner at a nearby small town. After finishing their meal at around 5 p.m., Robert's mother and aunt decided to do a little shopping. He wanted none of it. Being a typical guy, something was calling to him from the border of town. Maybe it was the long shadows cast by the autumn's late afternoon sunlight or the cool, crisp air. Maybe it was the leaves having peeked into their resplendent palette of gold, scarlet, and fiery orange. Or maybe it was something from another world. In any case, Robert found himself in a contemplative and reflective state of his mind. As he traced his way through the streets, then into the wilds beyond the edge of town, immediately adjacent to the village were a series of wide open fields, each bordered by thick clusters of woods. Robert had been walking alone for around 10 minutes when he began to hear something he had never heard before. Not with his ears, but in his head. It was, in his words a kind of sing-song chanting in my mind, which sounded like a multitude of a very sweet, pleasing set of voices that were all speaking the same words almost simultaneously, in a kind of cascading oral waterfall effect. Through this chorus of voices, Robert began to perceive phrases. Don't you see us? We're all around you. We're all around you. Don't you see us? Look, don't you see us? Robert was stunned, but not frightened. Instead, he simply stopped walking, allowed the experience to wash over him, looking around to try and find whatever so desperately wanted to be seen. He described what happened next. There was a smallish tree near me, but otherwise I saw only thick woods and open fields, and a two-lane road beyond either side. I did look around me, certainly not expecting to see anything unusual and saw nothing except the autumnal landscape. I heard the voices for about 90 seconds, and then the voices abruptly stopped. I walked on for another 20 minutes, and then returned to the town where I met my family. I said nothing to them about my experience and reflected upon it on the long drive back. I had discovered a secret of the forest. The following morning, Robert prepared for his train ride back to the city. Between packing and departing, he took one last walk behind his mother's neighborhood, along a wooded path between her newer development and the town's older homes. Once again, the voices intruded on his mind after about 10 minutes, exactly as they had the day before. We're here. Come this way. Walk this way. The voices, though, were whispered. We're here. Looking to his left, Robert saw another path dead-ending onto one of the town's streets. He followed the voices to the roadside, stopped, looked for traffic, and turned to walk to his mother's home along the curb. Rounding one of the curves, Robert saw something that was either a coincidence or a synchronicity. Either way, it affected him deeply. My eyes fell upon a grouping of four garden gnome statues on the front lawn of one of the homes, he said. The statues were traditionally sculpted and done in what I would call a tasteful and realistic manner. They weren't the kind of mass-produced cartoonish garden gnomes so prevalent today. The four gnomes were in sitting positions and arranged so that they were facing one another. When I saw them, it was like receiving a blow to the chest, though I realized instantaneously that they were statues. But seeing them at the moment seemed to identify the source of the voices to me in a manner which I can only call profound, as if the statues were what I was meant to see when I turned off the initial path. Robert's brief trip home afforded him a picturesque view of the surrounding farmland, painted bright orange by the setting sun. As he looks to the west, he heard the voices in his head one final time, less sing-songy and more straightforward. You're leaving us now, and the autumn door is closing. You will forget about us for a long, long while, but we have a date with you in the distant future. You will meet us again, then. At that instant, the sun dipped below the horizon. These experiences left Robert deeply moved. 
He had never believed in elves or fairies before visiting the countryside, yet from that day forward, he was unable to shake the sense that the world was stranger than he ever thought possible and had uncovered a secret from the forest. I think it was a fairy experience because of the garden gnome statues I came upon, which were so realistic, tasteful, and beautiful, he later wrote. The voices had essentially led me almost directly to the statues. However, I accept that, objectively speaking, I do not know what the actual nature of the voices was. It would be easy to assume that Robert's experience with the fairy voices took place in some storied little town in the Scottish countryside, where such a tale are dime a dozen, but it didn't. Robert was only a few hours from one of the largest cities on Earth. He had traveled upstate from New York City that weekend and heard fairies, not in some European glen or atop some Scandinavian mountain, but amidst the cow pastures and farmlands of rural America. Over the last few centuries, plenty of inaccuracies have crept into our pop culture conception of fairies. Roughly speaking, these changes begin with early poets and playwrights before filtering through the spiritual tradition of theosophy in the late 19th century. Films from animation studios like the Walt Disney Company further solidifying the idea of fairies that we hold today. Contrary to their modern depiction, Fairies were once understood as highly volatile beings, almost demigods, wingless and capable of appearing any size they choose. By the 20th century, the fairies appearing in children's entertainment had become almost unrecognizable. The modern fairy is a now tiny, sweet, and feminine, almost always fluttering around harmlessly on a set of insect wings. It would be too large a task to fully unpack what fairies once were, among other things, we aren't entirely sure how they began. Some say the human dead, others elemental, still others pagan gods and goddesses or demons and angels. Instead, let's focus on what fairies are. Suffice to say, their treatment of you can turn on a dime. If you please them with offerings and respect, they might extend their magical powers to bring you good luck. If you offend them in any way even by accident, or destroy any structures or plants they have laid claim to, any amount of misfortune can come your way, up to and including adverse health outcomes like paralysis, blindness, and yes, even death. This was the way that most of Western Europe perceived their fairies, a broad category which included related entities like elves, dwarves, gnomes, and sometimes even beings we don't normally think of as the fey folk. Mermaids, ogres, trolls, even giants, and some dragons blurred the lines between fairies and other supernatural creatures. Another modern misconception is that fairy belief is, or was, purely European. In reality, almost every culture throughout the world holds similar superstitions in some form or fashion. From the old world to the new one, indigenous people speak of uncannily similar races of little people. Almost all have a tendency to be short, but can shapeshift into whatever form they please and enjoy playing pranks. All fairies love kidnapping human beings, especially segments of the population traditionally held to be the most vulnerable, like women and children and those with disabilities, sometimes for breeding purposes. Most dwell either on the fringes of communities or set up residence in people's homes where they serve as household spirits assisting in chores. Many show an affinity for underground realms, serve as stewards of the living world, and yet, paradoxically, seem closely tied to the human dead, a far cry from our modern ideas of little Tinkerbell. Imagine the surprise felt by early European explorers as they spread across the globe only to find their own superstitions mirrored amongst the original inhabitants of other continents. This was especially true in North America. While belief in little people seems to be truly a universal thing, an argument could be made that most robust beliefs were found in the native populations of Ireland, the British Isles, Scandinavia, and surprisingly, North America. Each tribe had their own name for these beings, whom they lived alongside, Relationships between Native American tribes and their little people were sometimes peaceful, other times filled with tension. 
but all agreed in the reality. They were as much a part of life as any other natural phenomenon, like thunderstorms or the inevitable change of winter into spring. To be blunt, the similarity of fairies across distantly separated populations implies one of three things, none of which conventional scientists or historians truly accept. Perhaps there was once a global culture where ideas were easily exchanged between the old and new worlds. Perhaps something about little people is inherent in human belief, an upwelling from a shared collective unconsciousness, if you will. Or maybe, just maybe, at once the simplest and most radical idea, these things actually exist in some form. We once realized this. An entire library could be filled with old indigenous accounts of fairies passed down from generation to generation and widely regarded as factual. It might mean that they never existed. It also might mean that our modern world has entrained us to deny their existence. Although, we are taught that such things can't exist. Fairies appear in eyewitness testimony to this very day. Even if we set aside the possibility that the modern alien abduction scenario is just a reworking of old fairy folklore, an argument put forth by many ufologists, people still see beings closely corresponding to the fairies of yesteryear. This is the case not only in Europe, but in America, even in recent years. There are stories of modern American sightings, many of which come from the 2017 fairy consensus compiled by Professor Simon Young. Some, the indigenous fairies described by Native American tribes, seem to have been waiting for Europeans when they arrived. Weird, right? Others seem to have followed colonists from overseas, settling in the New World in an otherworldly reflection of European expansionism. In either case, they are still with us. Some stories explicitly illustrate how closely European and American fairies resemble one another. As mentioned, fairies in the Old World appeared adult-sized as often as they appeared tiny. The same can be said for modern fairy sightings in America. A middle-aged woman described her encounter in the 2000s with one such being while hiking through a state woodland preserve near Park Forest, Illinois. The witness had been enjoying the outdoors for around four hours when she decided to return home around sundown. It was approximately 8.30 p.m. when she stepped onto the pathway back to the nature center. As she did so, the temperature immediately dropped, as did all the sounds associated with a Midwestern summer. Insects, tree frogs, birds, even the distant coyote vocalizations all vanished in an instant. Where there had once been the voices of other hikers up and down the path, there was now complete silence. The witness described what she saw next. There was a stand of old oaks and hazel and hawthorn trees on the other side of the gorge. This bordered the path on the left-hand side. For just a moment, I could see someone watching me. I originally thought it was my husband. Long, very pale blonde hair, tall, broad-shouldered. But whoever it was, he was wearing different clothes than my husband would have been wearing when we drove out to the nature preserve. A fitted, odd-looking jacket of dark green material and fitted trousers of some light tan-colored material that might have been leather. It was tucked into knee-high boots that matched nothing my husband ever owned. Without any indication as to how, this figure simply vanished before the witness's eyes. She was 100% certain that she had not blinked, the person was simply there, then they weren't. Nor had he stepped behind a tree or leapt into the gorge between them. She continues, He had been looking at me with no particular expression. The distance across the gorge that separated us, the drop down is a good 100 feet or so, maybe 50 feet, so I could see him quite well. A few seconds later, the creature in the forest started making their sounds again. After that, I went back to the nature center and its parking lot rather faster than I had before. By the time I got back to the parking lot in our car, it was almost fully dark. My husband was wearing the same thing he had been when he had taken different ways to the forest. I decided not to ask him if he had been messing about in the woods with a different outfit, because I was pretty sure I would get an odd look from him if I did. We ended up divorcing three years later. I wasn't afraid afterward, but I did not linger. I had the sense that 
While I wasn't any sort of threat, if I persisted in staying, I might see things that I wasn't supposed to and that I would be rude. I wish I could see him again. He was very beautiful. Good thing she left. From the man's description, she might have been forced to sit through a Swedish hair metal rehearsal. Just joking. The ability of fairies to appear as different sizes is sometimes a function of their shape-shifting ability. Other times, that is because certain fairy races stand at different heights. In America, we see this reflected in Cherokee belief, where the Yunwei Junsi, or little people, are often regarded as equivalent to old world fairies. But so are the Nunehe, a race of spiritual beings outwardly indistinguishable from humans. In fact, the Cherokee Nunehe display so many similarities to Western Europe fae folk that we are left with only two possibilities here. Either early ethnographers contaminated Cherokee culture, or both Europeans and the Cherokee encountered the same beings, despite being only separated by the Atlantic Ocean. A stay with old world fairies might result in hours, days, months, or years of missing time. The same feature appears in Cherokee myths regarding the Nanahi. People might visit the Nanahi or stay with them forever either voluntarily or at the point of death, just as in so many Irish, English, Scottish, and Scandinavian legends tell. Some European fairies, just like the Cherokee's Nunahi, were said to dwell underground. More specifically, both European fairies and the Cherokee Nunahi appear in the vicinity of burial mounds and other earthworks. One of the most fascinating Nunahi legends describes their defense of the area around modern Franklin, North Carolina. The town was built around one of the Cherokee's oldest settlements, Nikwasi. Sometimes in the midst of prehistory, a powerful, mysterious tribe from the southeast invaded Cherokee lands, attacking Nikwasi just before daybreak. The Cherokee warriors fought valiantly, but were eventually overwhelmed by the invaders. Just when all seemed lost, a stranger approached the Cherokee chief and told him that another army would be coming to their aid. With that, hundreds of Nunahi poured out the central mound of Nikwasi, vanishing into thin air when they reached the battlefield. Invisibly, the Nunahi picked off the attacking tribe one by one, until only a handful of survivors surrendered and begged for mercy. The Nunahi rematerialized. They told the invaders that they should have never provoked a peaceful tribe, then disappeared back within the Nikwasi Mound. This story played out once again centuries later. The town of Franklin had since sprung up around Nikwasi, and the United States was in the throes of the American Civil War. When Union forces descended with the intent of burning the town to the ground, residents were left helpless. All able-bodied men were on the front lines as required. Yet... Union scouts returned to their commander and begged them not to burn down Franklin, as the entire town appeared to be heavily guarded by soldiers on every corner. The Union army pivoted towards Atlanta, leaving Franklin unscathed. Historical records failed to identify these mysterious guards, but the Cherokee knew the truth. The Nunahi had returned to defend their land once again. Another motif connecting old and new world fairies is unexplained light phenomena. Today, an orb of light in the sky is a UFO, while the same apparition in a haunted house is considered a ghost or a spirit. But at one point, strange lights bobbing through forest or along ancient burial sites were once regarded as the little people, roving across the landscape in luminous form. This was the case everywhere. Some contemporary American eyewitnesses still equate light orbs with fairies. In the 1990s, a witness from Georgia, whom we'll refer to as Cassandra, was taking a nighttime stroll through one of the Atlanta's green spaces when she perceived something odd on the path up ahead. The green space consisted of a garden that ran adjacent to a small cluster of old-growth forest and an old estate. It was sometime between 9 p.m. and midnight, and Cassandra's disinterested husband was following several paces behind her, which is why he didn't notice the odd green orb glowing in the trees. It was about the size of a child's ball. As for Cassandra, she suspected it was just a mylar balloon lodged in the branches, 
although she couldn't figure out how the light was reflecting off of it. Cassandra thought nothing more of the light until she approached a deep overflow ditch in the garden. In the ditch, there, sat a large bush, around which peculiar darkness had begun to manifest. Within moments, the classic image of a gnome, three feet tall, rustic clothing, including a vest and a red cap, popped into existence beside the bush. He had no beard, allowing Cassandra to easily see the grumpy frown he wore. Although he didn't move a muscle, Cassandra found herself terrified and fled to her husband, begging him to run with her back to their car. He later remembered that Cassandra acted so terrified, he assumed she had stumbled across a murder scene. Ah, good old Atlanta. Later, Cassandra revisited the green space in the daylight and recorded her observations. There was no Myler balloon in the tree, she said, adding that, the bush the gnome materialized at was what we in the South called Mountain Laurel. This last detail is crucial. Georgia's native Cherokee claim that several subsets of their little people can be found around specific features, including trees and rocks. One subset is known as the Laurel people, who, just like Cassandra's gnome, appear around laurel bushes. Strange lights seen in conjunction with fairies are sometimes separate, as in Cassandra's sighting. Sometimes the lights turn into fairies. Sometimes the lights contain fairies, almost suggesting that the light is some sort of electromagnetic field or perhaps even a mode of transportation. For example, Barbara Fisher, a long-term experiencer of high strangeness and host of Six Degrees of John Keel podcast, was and is well acquainted with actual fairy folklore and knew despite the fact that they could fly, that fairies traditionally never appeared with wings. When she began seeing lights and hearing music in the woods behind her home in Athens, Ohio, she figured it was probably just the little people. Over the years, Barbara and guests to her home started seeing tiny lights in the woods. Barbara was unsurprised. It had become almost commonplace and would happen often whenever friends were over. One night, Around the 4th of July, however, she got more than she bargained for. While the rest of the party played with sparklers in the front yard, she and a friend sat out back singing and watching the lights. These were not fireworks. The forest was too dense, and besides, these looked different. They looked like the fairy lights Barbara had seen before. They watched as one of the lights, this one orange, bobbed closer to stop six feet from her and her friend. Within, Barbara could see what looked like a large white moth. The light drew closer, coming within three feet. It then blinked, reappeared. Now the light contained a tiny, naked woman with wings. Barbara stopped singing. She was shocked, not only by the apparition, but by the fact that fairies weren't supposed to look like that. Fairies and folklore don't have wings. Barbara then felt a direct communication, like being slapped in the face. It said to her, Hey lady, I can look like what I want to. You can't tell me what I look like. Barbara and her friend ran back through the house to the safety of the front yard. Regardless of whatever lies beyond the fairy phenomenon, Barbara Fisher's story suggests that it is completely in control of its own appearance. It may also be influenced by cultural expectations, an objectively real intelligence that uses existing imagery in our heads to fine-tune how it looks. This might be, in part, due to the fact that fairies seem to have something to do with altered states of consciousness. We are all familiar with the appearance of psychedelic mushrooms and fairy art. This is no coincidence, as the ability to see fairies has long been attributed to talents like psychic sensitivity and the second sight. Certain states of mind, dreaming, meditation, trances, sleep deprivation, even psychedelic trips might facilitate their manifestation or make it easier for them to appear. This seems to be what happened to a pair of witnesses in California. One afternoon in the summer of 2010, a man and his girlfriend had decided to consume psilocybin mushrooms while relaxing by a stream in a park less than two miles from the Pacific Ocean. His girlfriend, a self-proclaimed psychic, had claimed numerous interactions with the fairy world in the past. In fact, mere moments before they began their mushroom session, she claimed to have spotted a giant in the forest. The boyfriend had seen nothing. 
One can only imagine how fun arguments must have been in this relationship. At any rate, the couple chatted about the giant as the mushrooms set in, then sat for 20 minutes in silence, watching patterns emerge from the foliage and water around them. After kissing for a while, they broke apart. The girlfriend called her partner's attention to something moving alongside a small bridge crossing the stream. This time, the boyfriend saw what she saw. He later described the vision. What appeared to be a person popped out from between the trees and onto the trail. He was still at least 500 feet away. Then he began moving down the path. I wouldn't know it was a male until later. This being appeared to be walking rapidly and sometimes skipping down the path, which was entirely visible to us from across the water. He turned, saw us, and then walked or skipped off the path over the bridge and was soon standing right beside us. The being seemed youthful and wore either a pair of leather pants or a loincloth. It was just as one might dress at a renaissance fair. Since they were sitting down, he towered over the couple, but couldn't have been taller than 5'7". His body was very well defined and tanned down to his bare feet. Underneath his thick, dark, wavy hair sat a pair of faintly pointed ears. This stranger told the witnesses that he was lost and needed help finding, of all things, for a ferry to own his car. Stunned, the couple indicated the direction of the nearest parking lot, at which the being thanked them. He confessed he wasn't sure how he had gotten lost and asked if he could stay with them. The lovers looked at each other and said together, No, I think we just want to enjoy each other's company, alone. The stranger then asked if they had a tent. Maybe he could camp with them. The couple refused again, and the elf skipped off out of sight. It is entirely possible that the witnesses had simply encountered a quirky hiker. Maybe it was Swinger's Day at the park, or maybe it really was an elf. In all seriousness, though, both witnesses were seasoned psychonauts and agreed that the mushrooms they had taken couldn't account for the light step the stranger had displayed, nor the vague repulsiveness they both sensed. While outwardly attractive, the elf seemed sinister in some way that they couldn't define. Perhaps they had barely escaped being kidnapped to fairyland. Our next tale shows that some children are not so lucky. Sock Ketch was an avid hunter who, sometime in the early 19th century, had grown too old to venture into the wilderness by himself. Instead, he would enlist fellow members of the Penobscot tribe to accompany him on hunting trips closer to his home in Old Town, Maine. On one such occasion, he and his party found all the game scared from their hunting grounds by another set of outdoorsmen. They set off further up the Kenduskeg, a large stream near the vicinity of Bangor, in search of new territory. Once they found an area that seemed promising, the men got to work setting up their traps. As they sat down to dinner that night, however, they were assaulted by a variety of strange noises. The sound of a flood or avalanche cascading down the mountain, lumberjacks working, unseen in the hills, blowing horns, banging drums, thunder, despite no cloud coverage, and a noise like a whistle in a tunnel. It disturbed them so greatly they could not eat. The more superstitious among them thought witches or devils in the woods were to blame. After choking down their dinner fast, the men retired. But the sounds, including the calling of Sock Ketch's name, continued into the night. Everyone awoke the next morning, bleary-eyed and sleep-deprived. After a quick breakfast, curiosity got the best of the men, and they set out in a canoe in the direction of the sounds. Unrecognizable tracks or footprints awaited them on the opposite bank. All the grass had been trampled down. The men spotted a pathway nearby, clear and obviously still in use. They bravely set up off the mountain where, reaching the top, they found a rocky summit with only a few bushes here and there. Sock Ketch described what happened next. On the south side of the mountain... We came to the edge and found that it was a precipice so high that the pines below looked like the small bushes near us. We also saw smoke coming out toward the ledge, and this puzzled us. And, as we did not know if of any hunters being near us, we determined to go at once to see where it came from. We retraced our steps and soon came to a little brook, nearly dry, and saw that rocks and stones had been moved from it. Also, that many trees had been torn up by their roots— 
These, we saw farther on, were made into a wall around something. On looking into this enclosure, we saw in the center a wigwam made of stone, its low door facing south. As we went to its east side, we found a ladder leaning against its wall. It was made of whale's jawbones. The twelve rounds were made of ribs of the whale. It went up and found a smooth, large, flat stone, in the middle of which was a hole on which was a kettle. In the hole below the kettle, water boiling and the steam which came up around it hid from us what was cooking. One of the men cut me a long pole with a hook on it. When I began to lift out something, we looked and first saw a child's dress, then some leggings, then a child's arm, then a foot, and finally a head. The men then saw a set of cutlery as big as themselves, fit for a giant. It was as if they had stepped into a dark fairy tale. Could they believe what they had found, that something gigantic was eating human children? The men decided that they needed to leave right away. They made their way back to camp, suffering through the noises another night. When they checked their traps the following morning, they found them surrounded by tracks left by tiny, bare human feet. One of the older men exclaimed, The Warnung Mexork are near us, referencing the dreaded water fairies of Penobscot mythology. Despite their misgivings, the men armed themselves and went in search of further evidence, finding small structures built out of the mud along the riverbank. Now, thoroughly spooked, the hunters decided to return to camp. As they did so, they stumbled upon something marvelous. Sock Ketch said that they discover near us in another direction a sand bed laid out with lines going across it which on looking nearer seemed to be like a village with walls going across it in the middle stood a wigwam about the size of a common flower barrel it was like a house and near it stood what was like a stable no glass was in the windows and no door in the doorway we found that it was all built of clay when we looked into the stable we saw three stalls and in each stall was a horse. The first was lying down, the second was standing up eating, while the third turned its head toward us. All these were in clay. We were more surprised when we looked at the house. It had three rooms. In one room was a large fireplace in which a kettle was hanging on an iron bar. Beside the fireplace stood a woman in a long dress and a ruffled cap. In another room, a table was spread with plates and cups. And in the third was a long board table, behind which sat a fat man smoking his pipe. On some shelves behind him were rows of bottles. All this was of clay. And in front of the house, in the sand, stood a high pole which, halfway up, had a piece of cedar wood stuck in it horizontally. On this was hanging a square piece of clay upon which we saw something written. But all the characters we could not make out. It seemed a strange language. First, cannibal giants, now an entire clay diorama. What was happening? By now, even the least superstitious men desperately wanted to relocate their camp. The hunters took to their canoes and made their way upstream until, after rounding a bend, they saw an entire horde of little people dancing, wrestling, and playing on a sandbar. One of them, apparently serving as a watchman, spied the hunter's canoe and shouted in the Penobscot language, The devil! Next Monday, past noon, one notch. The entire fairy crowd then ran off the sandbar and into the water, sinking into the depths. Within moments, they were all gone. Curiosity had now replaced whatever fear Sock Ketch felt. As he sat smoking his pipe after dinner that night, he decided that he wanted to catch one of the water fairies. To do so would require an elaborate plan. Keeping the hollow shaft of a river reed in his mouth for air, one of his friends would bury him in the sandbar around noon the following Monday. If the water fairies kept their appointed date of past noon one notch, he would leap out the sand and snatch one of them around one. It was agonizing, being buried alive. But sure enough, Sock felt movement above him shortly after his friends left him in the sand. According to his story, at this, I jumped up and quickly grasped what was near me. I found I was holding two small creatures. I called to my companions, and although they ran quickly to the place and could see the little people running, the latter had disappeared in the water before they could be reached. Seeing what I held in my hands, my companions became frightened and fell on the sand. Meanwhile, 
I was holding the little creatures who try to get away from me and cover their faces with sand. One of them begged me not to look at them. This I promised, but asked them to tell me where they came from. If they did, which I would let them go. After a moment, one said, if you release me, I will tell you. When he turned to me, I saw that he had the most beautiful fine long hair, but his face was narrow with so long a chin that it rested on his breast. His nose was so big and broad that you could see it on each side of his head when his back was toward you. His eyes were very narrow up and down, and his mouth was the shape of a sharp A, the point running under his nose. He wore no clothing and began to speak as soon as he was on his feet, saying, Today, I cannot tell about our people, but next Sunday morning at the first notch, nine o'clock, we will meet you at the lake, half a day's journey from here. In this lake, you will see three islands, one wooded, one partly wooded, and the third all rock. Go near to them, but do not land. Keep in your canoes until you see me. After this, we released both the little men who ran quickly to the water's edge and jumping in, disappeared in the ripples. The hunting party waited the remainder of the week. Once they reached the appointed place by canoe, they could see masses of little people darting along the shoreline, only barely glimpsed as they ducked behind tree trunks and boulders. At last, one of the water fairies stepped forward and indicated that they should paddle closer inland, like this. With an abundance of caution, the hunters followed. There, atop a large rock jutting out into the lake, they spied a sleeping giant. Enormous ringlets of gray hair covered his head, spilling out over his neck, which was as big around as a barrel. He wore a peculiar outfit composed of an olive green coat with a blue and red lining, a bright red undercoat, and immense shining black moccasins with silver clasps. The entire hunting party watched in amazement as the other water fairies hauled a series of buckets up to the rock where the giant slept. Sock now realized that the little person who had beckoned to them was the same one he had captured days prior. The little creature spoke to him saying this, We belong to a race of little folks, but this, pointing to the sleeping giant, is our king. There are twelve of them in the world. They can go through the air from place to place as easily as you walk or paddle your canoe. They live in the water or on the land. When children fall into the water and no one tries to save them, they catch them and take them to a place of safety. Once a year, all the twelve kings meet to hold a council, east of here, half a day's journey. When they cook these children in a great kettle and eat them, they are called water kings or water spirits and are known by the name No Dumb Can Wait. And we are called water fairies or Warnung Mixorak. Now, we are twelve tribes, and each tribe a ruler. We are scattered over the earth. They say that when the earth was divided, there were twelve tribes, and the half having transgressed, the laws was lost. We believe you people belong to these, for they have no real king. The earth is your mother, and you are born and die. But the water is our mother, and we live with her always. During seven months of the year, we are allowed to come on the earth twice a week for one notch at a time. One day, we have our sports, and Sunday we pay tribute to our king for his protection. We have long wanted to have you see us and our works, which, if you understand them, will show you many things that are to come and brought about by whom we do not know. This is the first time any of our tribe was ever caught by your people, but those of other tribes have been. Fortunately, you released us when we asked, or our king would have had this revenge and you would have been killed. But now we ask you, after we have showed you how we spend this notch in caring for our king to go away. Sock Ketch and his hunters watched as the water fairies began grooming the sleeping giant. After a while, the water fairy who had spoken to them mentioned that they should be on their way, and the hunters were happy to oblige. Who can say whether or not this was a tall tale? Sock Ketch went on to share the story with his own tribe's people, who in turn shared it with ethnographers at the Journal of American Folklore. Even if fabricated, the story brings together quite a few interesting details that would not have been out of place in European fairy story. Like in the Old World, these in Penobscot water fairies stole children. They gathered them at regular intervals, a behavior seen in Scottish fairies, 
who, according to some, collected souls once every seven years to fulfill a debt that they owed to the devil. Even the mention of the 12 lost tribes scattered over the earth brings to mind the 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of which were lost themselves. As the Christian church asserted its influence in Europe, it became commonplace to rework stories from the Bible into older fairy legends, combining the new faith with the beliefs of European populations. This often involved claiming that the fairies were angels too good for hell, too bad for heaven, or the shunned offspring of Adam and his first wife in Jewish tradition, the demon Lilith. The incorporation of the lost tribes of Israel while not apparent in old world thinking regarding fairies, is certainly consistent with the way that the church incorporated fairy lore into its own dogma. We may never know what truth, if any, lies behind the water fairies of Maine. However, it nests neatly into an ancient system of beliefs found in the United States long before the first settlers came to North America's shores. If we but listen to these older beliefs, we may learn something valuable about the world in which we live and what other intelligence we may be able to share with it. But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Are fairies real? Is this something that's truly tangible that we can see if we discover and learn more? Or are these all tales of fiction and were completely fabricated as history went on? Possibly misunderstandings? I'll let you be the judge of that one. But please, I want to hear your thoughts, so comment down below and let me know what you think. And if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this one. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in tomorrow's episode.